We're starting a series in the book of Revelation, and I'm super excited about this. You know why? Because we have been working on this for almost three years in our churchwide Bible challenge, and we finally made it to the last book. Hoorah! Right? And uh, my goal at the beginning was to preach in, right in line with our churchwide Bible challenge, which would mean that we would cover Revelation in three Sundays. And can anybody say impossible? <laughs> I was like looking at it, and I'm like, yes, I can do this. But I think we would miss something. And so what we're going to do is we're going to slow down on chapter 2 and 3. And we're going to cover the seven churches. Today we're going to be looking at one church. Next week we'll be looking at four churches. And then on the last Sunday we'll be looking at two. Then once we've completed that, we'll make our way through the rest of Revelation. So the series title is The Seven Churches of Revelation. And uh, the title of this message is A Distant Church. Now, in order, before we get to that church, I need to give you some background that's going to help you understand the word to this church. So we're going to start in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation at the beginning of the message and the NIV towards the end. So it says, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ. Who's the revelation from? Make sure you're there, okay? which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. Okay, so Jesus is coming. He's giving you a message, and it's about some events that are going to take place in the future. And I love two words. They must soon. Okay, these must happen. Jesus is coming back. Amen? Amen. All right, these are going to take place. Now, it's a revelation. What does that word revelation mean? How many of you uh, ever saw the, the show, Let's Make a Deal? Anybody? Right, you had these three different, uh, like a box. Sometimes there's a curtain there. And then this magical thing, when they choose one, all of a sudden the curtain reveals and you see something behind it. Now, that's what revelation is. It's an unveiling. So Jesus has always been... He knows the future just as much as he knows today. And he knows what is happening in the future. And he wants to take the curtain of the future and kind of unveil it a little bit so that you can see these events that are going to take place. That's what Revelation is all about. So he sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John. Was this John the Baptist? No, shake your head say, no, it wasn't. It was one of the disciples, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to put me on the witness stand, I hope you could trust me. But if you were to put Jesus on the witness stand, do you believe what he says? Yeah, okay. So this is his testimony of what's going to happen. How many of you would like to be blessed this morning? All right, here's how. Look at verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. So today we're going to be reading some words. Check that off your list. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church and who listens to its message. Okay, and I'm not talking about hearing the words because it's possible. Some of you uh, wives know this. You tell your husband something and... They're like, what? They don't remember what you say. It's possible to hear the words and not really listen. So God's going to bless the one who reads and actually listens, takes it to heart, who listens to its message and does what? Obey what it says. Okay, so if you want to be blessed, you have to read. What else? Listen and obey. If you read and listen, are you going to get the blessing? If you want the full blessing, you've got to read, listen, and obey. Why? Because the time is near. Jesus is coming back. Amen? All right. Let's talk about who He is. All glory to Him, Jesus, who loves us. I want you to think about the songs that we just sang. sang. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding His blood for us. Uh, I don't want you to do this, but think about... 
all the sin in your life and how heavy a burden that is, Jesus died on that cross so that burden could be lifted. So he loves you. He freed you by shedding his blood for you. And then there's one more thing that he did. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. So he loves us, he frees us, and he makes us. I could preach about that, but I, but I won't, okay? <laughs> he made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. So I want you to think about God's love for you. He loved you, and then he freed you, and then he made you to be more like him. Now, let's look at him. Verse 7, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven. Now remember when Jesus died, right? He was in, in the, the, the tomb. Third day, he rose from the dead. He appeared to over 400 people over a course of 40 days. And then how did he go? In the clouds, okay? And remember the angels came back down and they said to the disciples, you know, just as you've seen him go, he's going to come back the same way. So this is what's taking place. You're going to see him coming down in the clouds of heaven. Now, I personally believe, yes, they are normal clouds, but I believe it's also the presence of God. Remember in the temple, what happened when the Spirit of God came? The cloud filled the temple, okay? So look, he's coming in the clouds of heaven. Can you see it? And everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. So this is a glimpse into the future, not just of the people that are going to see him right there, but at the end time, everyone is going to have to face Jesus. Now that is a wonderful day for us, but a pretty scary day for those who do, are not right with God. We see this in the next part. And all the nations of the world will what? Mourn. So what makes us rejoice is going to make others mourn. Why? Because it's judgment day. You know, they've put off God and then all of a sudden they see that God is real and that they have rejected him and then that is a day of mourning for them. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning. I was there in the beginning and I'll be there in the end for eternity, says the Lord God. I am the one who who is right now, God is alive here today, amen? amen? And is still to come, who always was and who is still to come, the almighty, all-powerful one. Now, verse 10 says, it was the Lord's day. So there on, on Sunday, he's worshiping uh, the Lord. This is the day that they celebrate now because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the Spirit. So John wasn't just saying words to God. He wasn't just singing songs. He was actually connecting with the Spirit of God. I pray that every Sunday morning, really more than just Sunday morning, but I pray that when we gather here, that's what we're doing, that we are worshiping in the Spirit. Sometimes that comes out in other languages. Sometimes it's just connecting with the Lord. So it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit, and suddenly... I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. Hear that in your head. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Everybody say, good job, Pastor Joel, in pronouncing all those. All right, good. So he, he gets this and then... When he turned to see who was speaking to him, he saw seven golden lampstands. So just imagine your eyes are closed, you're worshiping the Lord, you hear this, this, this noise come, you turn back, and all of a sudden in the Spirit you see these seven gold lampstands. Now, I don't want you to picture uh, a candlestick on top of these. A lampstand for that time was a container that held something. You know what it was? It held oil, okay? And then that oil would be set on fire and would burn and produce light. Now let me tell you, this is very, very symbolic, okay? We're going to tell you what, what this means in just a little bit. But he sees these golden lampstands lit. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. So he is 
bright and shiny. He's in the middle of these lampstands. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool. Now, don't think somebody with just white hair. Okay, what I want you to see is the brightest light that you could possibly see. So much that you have to kind of turn away. Like if you were to look in the sun and its brightness in the center, it's like this pure white. If you were to see that, that's what I want you to see here. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. Wow. His feet were like polished bronze refined into a furnace. So he's bright. He's shiny. Remember Moses when he was in the presence of the Lord? What was he? He was shiny. Now just put that with Jesus to the nth degree. All right, he was refined in a furnace and his voice thundered like a mighty ocean wave. Now, how many of you have ever been to a sporting event before? And the crowd is cheering all at once or maybe chanting one thing. Uh, I don't know, what would they chant at a, a sporting event? Somebody help me out. Go UConn. Go UConn. So just to imagine, imagine 100,000 people shouting, Go UConn. It's a, it's a powerful thing to hear. It's amazing if you are in that place. Now, I, this is how kind of I, I picture this and hear this in my head. Jesus speaking with this, this basically echo, the, you know, this powerful voice. He held seven stars in his right hand. Does that mean he was a ninja? No. We're going to talk about that. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. You, you couldn't look on him because he was so bright. We're going to talk about what those seven stars are in just a moment. But when he saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. Now, some of you have come into contact uh, with God. You've been in His presence, and it's been powerful for you. But just like that song, you ain't seen nothing yet. When you see Jesus face to face, man, if we were to see Him in this body, I'd be just like Him. <laughs> Fall right over. But He laid His right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Remember, John saw him die on the cross. He also saw him as in his risen body and go up into heaven. And he's speaking to him again. I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Okay, what, what does that mean? Uh, I have the power over death. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is very important if you're reading the book of Revelation to understand this. What is he going to tell, you, tell us about? Things that are happening when? Now. And things that will happen in the future. Okay? So if you look at chapters 2 and 3, it is mostly of what is happening. Can you guess? Now. Looking at... Uh, four and on is what's going to be happening in the future. Look at verse 20. I am so thankful, you know, when, you, when there's these imageries like the stars. Can you imagine the speculation of people, what they would guess those stars would mean? I mean, if you were not to read the rest of it, what would you guess those stars would mean? Jesus holds the stars in his hand. <laughs> I am so thankful that we don't have to guess. Right? It's right here in verse 20. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Thank you, Jesus, for telling us because we didn't know. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Okay, now here's a part where it could go one of two ways. Uh, number one, it could be that God has an angel that watches over each church. So for Sardis, there was an angel in charge of that. For Philadelphia, there was an angel kind of over everything that was done there. Or does anyone know what the name angel actually means? Yeah. Messenger. So if you are talking about the messenger of the church of Sardis, what might you be talking about? 
Maybe the pastor, maybe the teacher, somebody that is leading that church. So this works in both ways, right? Because Jesus holds the angels in his hand. But how about this? Jesus holds the messengers of each church in the palm of his hand. That's powerful. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Seven churches. Just say it again. You get it. There you go. They are the seven churches. Now, you remember what I talked to you about these lampstands? What, what do they hold? They hold the oil. Oil in the scripture is representative of what? The Holy Spirit. Okay? So these churches hold the presence of God in them. And if they ever want to be in on fire, they have to have the presence of the Lord in them, right? If we meet in this place and we have no oil, don't come. If we meet in this place and we don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit here, you've come to the wrong place because we'll never be on fire without the presence of the Lord. We're finally here. Chapter 2. Are you ready? To the angel, so again, could be an uh, angelic, or it could be the, the pastor or the minister of this church. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. Now, you can pull out your big paper. Are you ready? Pull out your big paper. You got it? And uh, what you'll see in these seven churches, there is a pattern. And I presented this for you. We're only going to do the top row today, the church of Ephesus. But for those of you that would like to kind of study on, the, on your own and see if you can figure out these, you can complete the next six by reading and trying to fill in for yourself. But today, we're going to write that. So the first church is the church of Ephesus. And it writes, These are the words of him who holds the what? The seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So, if you're writing in that blank, here's what you can write. That Jesus holds seven stars in his right hand. And basically it's this. He holds the messengers in his hands. That's important. Let's look at the next part. He walks among the lampstands. What does that mean? He walks among the churches. Oh, this is exciting for me. Do you ever think about the fact... You know, there are angels that are in this place. I talked to you about this. But more important than any angel or any amount of angels, Jesus walks in this place. Maybe Jesus is walking right here and he's thinking about Vic and, and talking to Vic about, hey, Vic, you need to listen to this. Or, I love you, Vic. You know, he could be walking in this place while you're worshiping. He knows what you faced in your week and he is walking here among us. That is an absolutely comforting, amazing thing. And it's also a little scary. How in the world could that be scary? Can you imagine being in the presence of the Lord and treating it like it was nothing? Can you imagine being in the presence of the Lord actively involved in sin? That could be really scary. We need to remember that Jesus walks in and among our church. Amen? All right. Let's look at some of the good things that Ephesus had going for them. And they had some really good things. In verse 2, it says, I know your deeds. Chapter 2, verse 2. I know your deeds, all the good things that you do. Uh, the way you help with the poor. Uh, the way you tell people about me. Uh, way you're praying for people to be healed. I know your deeds, your hard work. You are hardworking and your perseverance. You don't give up. You keep serving me. So if you're writing in your notes here, write down hard work and perseverance. Ephesus was known for that. They worked hard. Now, is that a good thing? Yes. I pray that that would be said of Cross Point Church, that we work hard that we, we do the right thing, we help people, and that we don't give up. It goes on to say, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. So go ahead and write this in your notes. Can't tolerate wicked people. This is a hard one. 
You know, some messages that I preach fit right into the culture, okay? You talk about loving anybody and God's desire for us to love people. That is a message that most everybody will agree to. But is this an easy one? Can't tolerate wicked people? What is the message of our culture today? Tolerate. No, actually it's not. It's not tolerate. It's celebrate. It's move past tolerate to celebrate. But yet, in this church, they can't tolerate wicked people. Now, let me help you understand this. This is not like a targeting of certain individuals. But here's the thing. If you come into a church uh, to be a part of a church, and you continue in sin, and we ignore that, even though that it's right out against what God says... And we don't ever talk to you about that. We don't challenge you to grow. Then what have we done? We have tolerated that. And that allows that sin to grow. It allows it to spread to everyone else and to think, oh, this is okay. But this church had something good going for it. They didn't put up with it. They addressed issues that needed to be addressed. I know that's a hard one for some people to say amen to, but it's there. So I'll say amen. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. There is a lot of people who have called themselves apostles, right? You can look on the news, on the web, do a search for apostles and you'll probably find tons and tons of apostles there. But I can guarantee you this, that not everybody who calls themselves an apostle is an apostle, right? Not everyone that calls themselves Uh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is really a believer. If you got somebody reading your hand and they're calling themselves sister so-and-so, I don't think that, I don't, I know that they are not a believer. Let's put it that way. So this church had one thing going. Just because somebody had the name apostle didn't mean that they blanketly just received what they said. They actually checked the word of God and made sure that what they said was right from God. Okay? So, I want to say here, if for some reason, and I do, a, do my best to protect this pulpit, but if someone were to come in here with a big fancy title and start preaching uh, dumb stuff like, like uh, Jesus has already come back or Jesus is not the Messiah, I hope that you wouldn't just look at the, the name apostle and say, well, they must know what they're talking about, right? This church, we should be looking at the Word of God, comparing what they said. And so Ephesus was good. They tested people that claimed to be apostles, and then they judged rightly. So here it is, if you're taking notes. They tested false prophets and judged rightly. Let's look at verse 3. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name. Now, uh, most of you probably know this, but all the disciples were persecuted to the point that they died except for one, and that was John. Now, church history tells us that John was boiled. Talk about (laughs) Al. He was boiled alive, but God spared his life. Now, have any of you gone through persecution like that? No. They suffered for it. And in that church, in that time, there were probably people that had their possessions confiscated. There were people that maybe lost their uh, occupation, their job. Uh, Whatever it was, they faced a lot of things. But this church in Ephesus, they did not give up. They endured hardship for Jesus. That's a good thing, right? So they endured hardship for Jesus, if you're taking notes there. And let's look at verse 3. And have not grown weary. Now, if you faced all of those things in your life, and you're working hard, and there's people coming in trying to deceive you, and you're stopping them... It can be at the point where you like, oh, this is just too much. But for the church of Ephesus, they didn't give up. They have not grown weary. One last one. So if you're taking notes, have not grown weary. Let's look at verse 6, the last thing, good. You have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, of course, everyone knows what the Nicolaitans did. Maybe they don't. (laughs) 
uh, most scholars believe that they were involved in sexual immorality and teaching others it's okay to get involved in sexual immorality. But this church said no. They stood for what the Word of God taught about sexual purity. So if you were to look at this list, what would you say about this church? Now, this is an amazing church. They worked hard. They persevered. They didn't put up with, with wickedness. They tested the prophets, judged rightly. They endured really tough stuff for Jesus. They didn't grow weary. They didn't get involved in the sexual immorality. This is a good church. But yet, what I'm about to share with you really changes everything that we have just said. And it's this, in verse 4, and this should break your heart. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. King James puts it this way. You have forsaken your first love. Who's that talking about? Jesus. Okay, here's the thing. We can have the best food pantry out there. We can have the best outreach to the police. We can uh, visit people in the hospital. We can give to the poor. Uh, We can have wonderful messages, wonderful programs for the kids. We can keep the machine of the church moving and moving and moving. But if we don't love Jesus, all for nothing, right? How about you in your life? Are you doing the the work? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you you tithing? Are you uh, ministering to other people? Are you trying to teach your kids about God? Are you coming to church on Sunday because you're supposed to come to church on Sunday, but really you don't even know why you're doing it anymore? Or Do you come to church because you love Jesus so much that you can't wait to hear from Him? Do you minister to the cops because you love Jesus so much that you want people to know about Him? Do you give to the poor? Do you do the food pantry because you love Jesus? Do you serve in the nursery? Do you give in the offering? Do you do those things because you love Jesus so much? That is the reason why we should do those things. So what is the command? For each one of these churches, there's a command. The command is this. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. I know I don't usually do this, but can can we stop? And I believe God wants to bring this to home, but I need His Spirit to do that work. So can you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are looking at Your Word. We don't just want to read words. We want to listen. We want to allow that to to penetrate our heart this morning. And Lord, we want to obey. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to do what I cannot, that you would open up the hearts of every single person that's here and they would look inside and they would ask themselves this question. Do they love you like they did at first? Have they lost their first love? Lord, speak to them. Speak to me. Speak through me, I pray. In your name, Jesus. Amen. What is the command? Consider how far you have fallen. Do you remember the day you asked Jesus Christ into your heart? Maybe it was like this. You're sitting in the seat. You heard the preacher preach and you were convicted of your sin. You knew that you were dying and on your way to hell. And you're overcome with emotion. You can't wait until the moment that there's this opportunity to go forward. And and you go forward. You go down to the altar and you're thinking about all the things that you did in your past. And you're like, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me. I know I've sinned against you. Would you come in and be my Lord, my Savior? I want to follow you. I believe in you, Jesus. In that moment, you feel the peace of God come on you. You know that God loves you. There's tears flowing down and and you get up from this place and you are changed completely. And there's this love and this passion and you're overflowing with joy that you can't help but tell, you know, your friends, hey, I just went to church and I've been struggling with this and and God saved me. Hey, would you come and go with me? This is, you got to come. 
that excitement that's there. You got excited to open up the Word. Matter of fact, when you started reading, you couldn't stop. You just kept reading through the Gospels just because it was so exciting for you. You couldn't help but talk to other people about it. Do you remember that passion that you had? What does Jesus say? Consider how far you have fallen. I gotta get up. I gotta get up early to read my Bible. All right, one or two verses. I guess that's enough. Yeah. I have to go to church on Sunday. Well, maybe I'll just go in late and be left, and I can leave early. Let's do that. You mean I have to give in the offering? I, I got to serve in this area. Consider how far you have fallen. Okay, let's stop. Let's make this real. Just close your eyes where you are, you're at right now. And let's obey this. First command, consider how far you have fallen. I'm not going to answer for you. You answer to Jesus for this. Consider how far you have fallen. Do you remember? Do you have that same passion, that same love for Jesus? Consider how far you have fallen. And what's the second thing that God asks you to do? Jesus, repent. Okay, so wait a minute. You mean that I can be giving, I can be serving, I can be going to church every single Sunday. Man, I can be persecuted. There's people at my work that are making fun of me. I've lost promotions over this. And you mean that I can be doing all of these things in Jesus? You're telling me that I need to repent just because I don't love you the way that I did back when I first got saved? Yes. That's exactly what it's saying. Repent. What does that look like? Let's just make this real. Lord Jesus, I remember what it was like when I first saw you. When I first was convinced of my sin, I knew you were real, and I knew I needed you more than anything. And I humbled myself before you, and I asked you to come in and be my Savior. Man, there was a peace like nothing else. I loved talking to you. I loved singing to you. But Lord, I'll be honest, there's times now that it feels like a chore. I repent. I humble myself before you. God, you don't deserve that. You deserve all my love. That's what it looks like to repent. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Now, my feeling is this that it's really hard to continue to read the Word of God and get something out of it. It's really hard to, to sing and pray and not get something out of it. My guess is this, is that if you uh, are not in that place where you need to be, that means that probably you stopped reading the way that you're supposed to be. You probably stopped talking to God. You probably stopped worshiping the way that He has called you to. Go back and repent and do the things that you did at first. So if you're taking notes, remember the height from which you have fallen. Second command, repent. Change directions. Third, do the things you did at first. Well, what are the consequences if you don't repent? What are the consequences if you're, pl- if you're doing church but you're not loving God. Here are the consequences. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. What was the lampstand? The church. That means that if we put on the very best show we could put on at this church, we have the best outreaches 
but yet we as a people do not love Jesus. If we don't do these things because we love Jesus, that means that God can uproot our church. I think that's what it means. I will remove your lampstand, your church, from its place. Here's the thing. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your service. He can send angels, right? He allows us to be a part of his work. But what he really wants is us to love him. He wants us to experience the joy of loving him so much that we serve. Loving him so much that we give. Loving him so much that we shout for joy in his presence. That's what he wants for us. So the consequence is he'll remove your lampstand from its place. And I want you to consider what happens to you. That's on a church level. What happens on to, for you if it's just works and you're not loving Jesus? I want you to pray and think about where that leaves you. Verse 7. Whoever has ears. How many of you have two ears? You got them? See, most, some of you don't, but most of you do. Looks like. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay? He was speaking to the church of Ephesus right then, but we get to be a part and say, hey, are we like that? Is there something that we need to hear as well? So in each one of these uh, words and messages to the churches, there's also a promise, a promise to the one who overcomes. And it's this. To the one who is victorious, or if you're reading King James, I think it's to the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You know what I see in this first, first part? To the one who who is victorious, to the one who overcomes. You know what that speaks to me? It's not always easy to keep your love for Jesus. It's easy to do stuff and not to do it in our love for Jesus. And this world is competing for your love, right? Through the things that it offers, through the temptation, all it wants to do is to distract you from Jesus. But... To the one who fights that distraction, who focuses on Jesus and loves Jesus, that one I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Could uh, those that are helping uh, with the altar time go ahead and come forward? What does that mean? I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It basically means that this, you're going to get to live forever, for eternity, okay? If you love Jesus, that is your future. Eternity in heaven with Jesus. Could you stand with me? I'm wondering if you are bold enough to say this basically to God. Jesus, get me. (laughs) You know what I mean by that? If, there's, if this is a message that I need to hear, if I am not right with you, are you bold enough to say, Jesus, get me? I, I, I'm going to pray a prayer, and if this is, this is you, pray this with me. Jesus, I want to know, are you talking to me today? Has my love grown cold for you? Have I been about the stuff of, of serving you but I've forgotten my love for you. I want you to ask that to the Lord right now. If you're brave enough, ask. What is he saying to you? If he is speaking to you, remember the command. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Go back in your mind to the day that you received the Lord. Go back in your mind to those mountaintop experiences with Jesus. Secondly, repent. That's owning up. Say, God, I've let other things 
come between me and you. And I want to change that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Do the things that you did at first. That passion, your love for Jesus, telling others about him, studying the word, praying, talking to him, enjoying time in his presence. Do the things you did at first. I'm going to open up these altars, and I want... I'll be honest with you. As your pastor, as your messenger here in this place, I don't know what it is about this altar that scares people. I I, I don't know if you have more important things to do, but all I can tell you is that God meets people here. Would you come? If God is speaking to you, would you come before Him today? Say, I'm sorry, God. Remind me afresh. Lord, help me to love you more every single day. Would you come to this altar and let's renew our faith in the Lord.
had the opportunity.